Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the seminar series for the Changing Electric Energy System Seminar. Um, I'm Daniel, resident of MIT. Uh, today, we'll be having uh, Dr. Wei Du. Um, he received his PhD in electrical engineering from Tsinghua University, uh, Beijing in China in 2014. His main areas of control uh, of research are control design, modeling, and simulation of power systems with high penetration of power electronic devices. Uh, Dr. Wei Du is currently a staff research engineer at the Pacific Northwest National Lab and serves as the principal investigator for several, several multi-million dollar projects funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, which focus on studying the impacts of high penetration of inverter-based resources on transient and dynamic behaviors of power systems at different scales. Um, Wei, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invite and the introduction. So uh, let me share my screen. So yeah, so hello everyone. So today my presentation is about uh, grid forming inverters at scale. So uh, first I will talk about some study on the single microgrid, and then we'll transition to an integrated transmission distribution system with more than 10,000 inverters. So here are the outlines. So first, uh, first of all, I will talk about some research on the search microgrid about how its search microgrid deal with uh, overload events. And then a second thing, a second part of the presentation is about the comparative study of two widely used grid forming droop controls. Uh, so we'll provide an insight into the different dynamic response of these two uh, widely used droop controls. And the third part, I will talk about some modeling and simulation of an integrated TND system with more than 10,000 inverters. And for the uh, last section, I will talk about some challenges of operating grid forming inverters in bulk power system. So specifically, I will talk about some trend and stability issue and the fault right through behavior of grid forming inverters. Uh, and then I will talk, uh, share some final thoughts and talk about the future work. So I have to say that actually for the first three sections, I pre presented these, these materials at different uh, webinars. So, so some of you may, might be already familiar with those materials, but for the, uh, the first section about the trend and stability and fault right through behavior is something uh, I think that's a very, very critical for grid forming inverters and it's still ongoing and I can share some, uh, some thoughts on this area. Okay, so the first topic about uh, survivability of autonomous microgrids during overload events. So let's let's briefly review the concept of grid forming and the grid following. So I think uh, nowadays most grid connected inverters use these voltage sourced inverters, uh, but actually different control uh, strategies make their dynamic behaviors totally different. So actually there are two types of controls. The left side is called a uh, grid following control. So today maybe 99.9% more than that, uh, you, uh, for inverters, grid connect inverters, they use uh, this grid following control uh, for, uh, for, uh, to operate in a bulk power system. So basically, they, they make this voltage source converter approximately behave as a, a current source. They use the current control loop and the phase lock loop to control the magnitude and the phase angle of this current injected to, to the grid. So people do, did that from the very beginning, but I think now let's take a look at this. Now I think this kind of control design was a kind of short-sighted because if in the future, if we really have massive integration of renewables into the grid, so this kind of grid following control will not work very well. Uh, in contrast, at the right side is about grid forming concept. So the grid forming concept, they make this voltage source inverter approximately behave as a voltage source. So the controller directly control the voltage magnitude and the phase angle of this voltage source. So this concept mainly came from microgrid, but nowadays people mainly uh, are more interested in study how this control uh, strategy impact the bulk power system, the grid forming inverters impact the bulk power system. So, so to summarize uh, these two controls, I will say that at the left side for the grid following inverters, uh, I will say that at the beginning of a disturbance, the inverter output current is approximately constant. And then there are some external controls that adjust the uh, reference signal of this current reference uh, of this current. And for the grid forming inverters, so I would say that at the beginning of the disturbance, the inverter internal voltage is, uh, is held constant, approximately constant. This is more like a synchronous machine. And then there are some external controls that adjust the 
voltage magnitude and phase angle, such as the droop control. Uh, so then I'll talk about uh, droop control for grid forming inverters, because as I mentioned, the grid forming inverter behave at the voltage source, uh, approximately behave at the voltage source. However, there are two key uh, elements for this uh, grid forming inverters. Uh, other than this voltage source, another important piece for this uh, grid forming inverter is the coupling reactance, because this coupling reactance X, XL actually plays a ma major role for de decoupling P and Q control. Because if this, you can see in this slide, if this XL is well designed, we can see that P is approximately linear with the phase angle and the Q is approximately linear with this uh, uh, magnitude, uh, voltage magnitude. So with this, with this decoupling characteristic, so actually people can design controllers to control, to regulate the P and the Q by controlling the voltage and the, uh, uh, by control, uh, regulate P and the Q by controlling the voltage magnitude and the phase angle. So actually, so why we need the droop control? So the droop control is just to make sure multiple grid forming inverters can uh, work in parallel in a stable manner. So for example, this power versus frequency droop control is actually a very simple a negative feedback control. So let's take a look at this uh, single machine, single grid forming inverter infinite bus system. So based on this classic equation, we can see that P is approximately linear with the phase angle delta P. So let's assume if there is a small disturbance cause this, cause this phase angle delta P to increase. And based on this equation, we can see the increase of this delta P uh, actually results in the increase, increase of uh, active power P. And if we use droop control, we can see that when the P increase, this controller reduces the frequency, angular frequency uh, omega. And we, if we reduce this frequency, and then because the phase angle is the integration of this frequency, if you reduce the frequency, the phase angle will also be reduced. So if you take a look at this uh, control, it's like, like once there is a disturbance cause the phase angle to increase, but the droop control actually eventually prevents this phase angle to further increase. So this is a very simple negative feedback mechanism that assures multiple grid forming inverters can work in uh, parallel and maintain the synchronism of their phase angles. So similarly, the QV droop control also uh, try to avo avoid the large circulating reactive power between these voltage sources. After reviewing this basic concept of voltage uh, grid forming inverter and also the droop control, here I'd like to talk a little bit about the third AEP microgrid test bed. So uh, this test bed is probably one of the earliest inverter, inverter based microgrids uh, in the world. And it was, it was founded by US Department of Energy. And the PI for this project is uh, Professor Bob Lester from University of Wisconsin-Madison. So this platform has actually been running for almost 20 years and they have done a lot of work um, a lot of pioneering work on grid forming inverters for microgrid operation. And I was in involved in this uh, program when I was a student. And uh, so here for this section, I will mainly talk about how such microgrid uh, uh, deal with the overload events. So as, as I mentioned that a grid forming inverter uh, behaved at the voltage source behind impedance during normal operations. However, uh, the grid forming inverter is not an infinite bus. It has its own uh, power limitation and the current limitation. So uh, it is very likely that during the microgrid operation, a large step change in the load can cause the overload of this grid forming inverter. So, so we need to deal with this uh, overload uh, events of grid forming inverters. So for the search microgrid, actually they designed a very simple overload mitigation controller, or sometimes we call it PMAX controller, that to address this over, overload issue by controlling inverters frequency. So basically you can see that it is a very simple anti one PI controllers added on the traditional droop control. And then uh, actually when the PMAX is reached uh, during overload events, uh, this droop curve actually becomes vertical. So this controller has two functions. So the first thing is about the overload transfer. So when some, some inverters in your microgrid are overloaded, this controller can transfer the, autonomously transfer the extra load to other inverters. And when, some, when all the inverters in the microgrid are overloaded, so this controller actually can activate the under frequency load shedding. So here, but let's talk about the first function, the overload transfer. Uh, so let's, let's consider a very, very simple uh, two grid forming inverter system. So we have inverter A1, grid forming inverter A1, and the grid forming inverter A2. And then we, we, 
dispatch the output power of A1 to near its max maximum at the very beginning. So we can see that uh, at the very beginning, the output power of A1 is close to its maximum and A2 is far away from its maximum. And in this case, if we switch this low to on, we'll see that both inverter, grid forming inverter A1 and the grid forming inverter A2 increase their currents almost instantaneously to meet this load change. This is just because they behave at the voltage sources. They keep their internal voltage constant at the, during the transient, so their currents just uh, comes up very autonomously to meet this load change. However, uh, there are some problems for, for this situation because A1 is already close to its maximum before the fault, uh, so be, before, dis, before the disturbance. Then we can see that after the disturbance, uh, the grid forming inverter output power for A1 exceeds its maximum. So this, this that's caused overload of A1. So this, a, this overload will cause issues, uh, maybe collapse the DC bus of the inverter or stall a synchronous generator. So we need to solve this overload issue. So for the third microgrid, as I mentioned, they use this very simple anti wind up PI controller to, to solve this uh, overload issue. The key concept here is that once a P exceeds P max, this controller will be activated to reduce the frequency rapidly uh, of this own inverter, of this A1 inverter. And by reducing the frequency, actually, we can change the phase angle between these two inverters. So this can redistribute the power flow between the two inverters. So uh, here are the uh, results, the test results with this P Pmax controller enabled. So you can see that for the same testing, if we have this Pmax controller enabled, we can see for the same event, if we switch the load to on, we can see both A1 and A2, firstly, still increase their output power or current to meet this load change because they are just voltage sources. And then we can see that once A1 becomes overloaded, uh, this Pmax controller is activated to reduce its frequency uh, rapidly. You can see during the transient, actually, the frequency of A1 drops faster than the frequency of A2. So this frequency difference actually results in the change of phase angle. And the change of phase angle actually redistributes the power flow between the two inverters. So we can see that after about 0.2 seconds, the output power of A1 stays at its maximum, and the second source just pick up the uh, uh, extra load. So this is just an autonomous tra load transfer from A1 to A2 for uh, using this uh, Pmax controller. So, and uh, then here, after talking about the first function about overload transfer, here we'll talk about second function is a more severe case in a microgrid because sometimes uh, if the loss of generation units in the microgrid can result in the overload of the entire uh, microgrid. So in this case, how we survive, uh, let the microgrid survive these severe uh, overload events is, is a, the second challenge we need to deal with. So for this case, actually, uh, when we have any, for this case, we actually, we have three sources. We have grid forming inverter A1, the synchronous generator B1, and the energy storage. And we treat this energy storage as a contingency. So actually this results in the overload of both uh, grid forming inverter A1 and the synchronous machine B1. And both A1 and the B1 actually are equipped with this Pmax controller. So when this Pmax controller, so when the, once this overload happens, actually the Pmax controller for both A1 and the B1 are activated. So that means their droop curve all become vertical. That means when both A1 and A2 are overloaded, both of them reduce their frequency. So actually this, this the entire system, uh, the entire system, the frequency keeps dropping during this overload event. And then actually we have a frequency relay installed at load bank four. So this uh, frequency relay actually detects this uh, under frequency event and trips this load bank four and the system survives this overload event. So you can see uh, here that actually the key message is that when the, uh, all, the, when the, all the sources in the microgrid are overloaded because of the lo loss of generation event, uh, the droop curve of all inverter grid forming sources becomes vertical because of that Pmax controller. And then that can help trigger the under frequency load shedding in this microgrid. And the left side, actually, the fuel test results. So we can see when energy storage is tripped, and then both sources are overloaded, and then the, the entire system of frequency is driven down, and the load bank forward tripped. And the right side, actually, are the both the EMT and the uh, simulation, uh, the po uh, positive sequence, a uh, phase simulation results. So the simulation results match very well with the fuel test results. OK, so after talking about the overload events, and another important finding from this search microgrid is the small signal stability boundary. Because uh, 
what we find that uh, we, when we do this work, we want to understand how we design the parameters for this Pmax controller. And we find a small signal stability boundary. We find that the coupling reactants, the value of coupling reactants is very important for the small signal stability boundary. You can see here, we find this uh, two dimensional uh, stability, stability boundary. You can see that a larger coupling reactants actually allows a larger uh, proportional gain of this Pmax controller to maintain the stability. And this stability, stability boundary actually also applies to the, the droop control gain. So it's a very similar uh, linear uh, st stability boundary that we find from, uh, from this study. So this, this is important for the uh, next section. So then after talk, talking about how the uh, search microgrid survive overload events. So in this section, I'd like to uh, talk about some uh, comparative con comparative studies of two widely used grid forming droop controls. Because when I was a student, uh, when I read the papers in the Power Electronics Society, there are just a lot of different power electronics controls. And sometimes I was lost. So there are just too many controls. How do we understand those different control strategies? So, so I think, uh, so that's why I'm doing this presentation today. So just trying to, uh, to provide some insight into different uh, control strategies of grid forming inverters. So uh, here is this just uh, this slide just show two widely reported grid forming droop controls. Uh, when I was a student, I think now they are still widely reported in the in the literature now. So at the left side actually is uh, still the very simple search search droop control. We call it the single loop droop control. You can see that there are uh, the controller directly regulates the magnitude and the phase angle the phase angle of the modulation waveform. So there are no any uh, inner control, inner voltage or current loops. And then at the right side, actually, there is also a called droop control, but it's other than this PF and QV droop control, there are some additional voltage loop, inner voltage loop and current loops uh, that to in this controller. So, so what's the difference between those two controls? Are they the same or do they result in this different dynamic responses. So actually when I was a student, I, I don't know that. I didn't know that, but today I think I, I, I can provide some insight into these two controls to help understand the, the design philosophy the design philosophy of these two control strategies. So uh, let's take a first glance. So at these two controls. So as I mentioned at the left side uh, is a search through control. We have a very simple control structure, just PF droop control rec that regulates the phase angle of the modulation waveform and the QV droop control re that regulates the magnitude of this modulation waveform. And we have LCL filter. Typically, we, uh, L, L1 is much smaller than L2 because we know the importance. We, we think L2 can play a major role as a coupling reactance, and we know the importance of this coupling reactance. And the right side is a multi loop droop control. It also has LCL filter and uh, uh, the inner uh, droop control, but also the cascaded inner voltage and current loop controls. And I noted that in the literature, typically L1 is much, uh, much larger than L2. Sometimes in the paper, they even do not have L2, they only have L1. So, but this, this probably doesn't help you to understand uh, this control, uh, those two controls too much. So, so we need to go further. So uh, if we review the basic concept of grid forming inverter, so we know that it behaves as a voltage source behind the impedance. So for those two controls, where are those uh, equivalent voltage source? And where is that uh, equivalent coupling reactance? So we need to find out uh, through analyzing those two controls. So for the single loop droop control, you can see that as I mentioned, the PF droop control regulates the phase angle of this modulation waveform. And the QV droop control regulates the magnitude of this modulation waveform. So what, so what this control is doing is actually, it treats the internal modulation waveform, or I'll say the Bridge, bridge side voltage as a controllable voltage source. And then the controller just regulates the E and the phase angle of this internal, internal voltage, also in the modulation waveform. Then in, its, in the fundamental frequency, it behaves as a volt, controllable voltage source uh, behind impedance L1 and L2. So both XL1 and XL2 should be considered as a coupling reactants because it's regulating the phase angle and the magnitude here. And for the multi-loop droop control, it's a little bit more complicated. So what this inner voltage and current loops doing is that it, want, it wants to control the filter capacitor voltage uh, through a very high bandwidth 
uh, voltage and current control loops. So what they are doing is that this, this inner voltage and current loops make the filter capacitor voltage as a, approximately as a controllable voltage source. And then this, Q, uh, then, then this PF and QV group control basically regulates the phase angle and the magnitude of this filter capacitor voltage. Then with this understanding, we can see that this control actually uh, makes the filter capacitor as a voltage source. And so in the fundamental frequency, it behaves as a voltage source behind impedance XL2. So only XL2 should be considered as a coupling reactance. And this L1 and the C1 should not be included in the fundamental frequency domain because they are compensated by this inner voltage and the current loops. So you can see that the, the different, these, these two controls actually result in different, a significant difference in the coupling reactance, the value of the coupling reactance. If you still remember that small signal stability boundary, you will see that the difference in coupling reactance actually results in the difference in the stability uh, dynamic response. So here, here let's do some uh, eigenvalue study, small signal study. Let's just use a two grid forming inverter system as an example. So in this case, we have two identical grid forming inverters. Uh, we make this L1 at, at about 6% and L, L2 at 1%. So you can see L1 is much larger than L2. So in this case, uh, we can uh, both the, the single loop droop control and the multi loop droop controls can be applied to the same inverter. And the left side is that uh, results with both inverters using the single loop droop control. You can see that the when if we keep increasing the droop gain, the system does not lose stability until the droop gain is higher than 9.2%, right? Uh, so typically people just use the one or three, one to three percent droop for operation, but the system doesn't lose stability until the droop gain is higher than 9.2%. But for the right side, if we use a multi-loop droop control for those two inverters, we see that the system loses stability once the droop gain is larger than 2.3%. Again, this is just how this, how, the, how this difference in the coupling reactance impacts the small signal stability boundary. And then here, let's do some time domain EMT simulations and also hardware in loop simulation. So you can see that uh, for this case, for case one, L1 larger than L2, uh, if we use 1% droop gain, and if we change the set point of one inverter, we can see that uh, for the droop control, uh, for left sides, for the single loop droop control, the system is pretty damped. Uh, this is because they have larger coupling reactants. And for the right side, if we have the same disturbance, we can see if both inverters use the multi-loop group control, we can see some oscillations in, uh, in this system between the two inverters because of the sm very much smaller coupling reactants. If we plot them in the small signal stability boundary, you can see that for, for the single loop droop control, it's far away from the small signal boundary, a small signal stability boundary. But for the direct droop control, actually, uh, so, for, sorry, for the multi loop droop control, actually, it's very close to the small signal stability boundary. So that's why uh, the, for the multi loop droop control, it's, it's much less damped compared to the, the third droop control. And if we keep increasing the droop gain from 1% uh, to 3%, we can see that the, the, for the third droop control, it's still stable, right? Because it's far away from the boundary. But for the multi-loop droop control, actually the, things, uh, the system loses stability because the droop gain is larger, is higher than this uh, boundary. So this simulation just verifies, uh, also verifies the small signal analysis. And then let's take a second case, like look, let's look at the case two. For this case, actually we, we exchange the value of X1 and L2. We make L1 to be smaller, much smaller, just 1%. And uh, X, X2 now is 6%. So based on that uh, a circuit in the fundamental frequency, actually we can see that both the third droop control and the multi-loop droop control have very similar coupling reactants, right? Because for the uh, third droop control, it has 7% uh, coupling reactants. And for the multi-loop droop control, it, it has 6%. Uh, uh, coupling reactants, then we should expect a very similar di dynamic response. So you can see, look at the simulation, if both inverters, both controls have 1% droop gain, their dynamic response are very similar. Uh, if we increase the droop gain to 3%, again, they are still very similar because they are close to each other in this stability, uh, in this st uh, stability boundary map, right? Uh, if we keep increasing the droop gain from 3% to 9%, then we start to see some difference. Uh, you can see both of them are much less damped, but however, the, the third droop control is still stable because it's very close to this boundary, but it's below the boundary, so it's still stable. But for the multi-loop droop control, uh, it's, it's higher than the boundary. That's why it's low stability. 
So again, uh, this kind of small signal analysis and the simulation just help to uh, provide insight into, into the design philosophy of these two controls and help uh, people understand why, what, how, we, how we should design grid forming inversion controls. And then let's take an extreme case because I heard from a lot of paper, I saw a lot of paper are saying that grid forming inverters do not work very well in strong power grid, uh, in strong grid. I think that statement was somehow in, incorrect. I think that really depends on how you design your uh, grid forming controls. So let's take this case as an example. If we have this grid forming inverter with only L1, no L2, and, and then if we apply the multi-loop drip control, then you can see that uh, in the fundamental frequency, it's like ideal voltage source connected to an ideal voltage source. Because if we assume this is strong grid, so it's also an ideal voltage source. So you can see that from the very basic circuit theory that you know that uh, this will not work because two voltage sources cannot work in parallel. So, so but if you use the uh, the direct the third group control, uh, the L two is in the circuit, so it can still work. So I think that's basically uh, that's purely decided by how you uh, design your controller. So here, what I'm saying is that actually the better understanding of the control structure matter matters more than the parameter tuning. So before you start to tune your parameters try to see if you understand the control structure of this uh, grid forming control better. Uh, then this is the second section. And then we go to the third section is about uh, simulating an integrated transmission and distribution system, system with 10,000 inverters. So the background of this information is like that. We know that uh, many synchronous machines are retiring these days. Meanwhile, more, more and more inverter based resources are connected to both transmission and distribution systems. And the boundary between transmission and distribution system is actually blurring, blurring. And then the interaction be, be, becomes them, uh, between them need to be uh, further studied, especially re regarding the stability. So how do we understand the dynamic behavior of such complex system with millions of power electronics devices connected at both transmission and distribution levels? So at PNL, actually we did some uh, simulation work. So we use our own simulation tools uh, to, uh, to develop an integrated TND transmission distribution system co-simulation platform. So to, to look at a system with more than 10,000 inverters at both transmission and distribution levels. So we can see that at the left side is a, is a medium whack trans transmission system. Actually, this system is modeled in our open source tool called GridPack. It is, it's basically very similar to the PSIC. It's kind of uh, or uh, met power. It's just like a positive sequence tool. A simulation tool, but it can support the uh, support the parallel computing. And at the right side, actually, is a, a distribution system simulation tool also developed by PNL. It's a three-phase phaser distribution system tool that can study how the DERs uh, impact the distribution systems. And then for the mini wax system, actually, for each load bus, we replace the load we replace the load bus with a distribution level eight five hundred node test feeder. And for each test feeder, we have the uh, add 500 inver 550 inverters in the feeder. So that means this system, totally, this mini wax system, totally has 19 load buses, and then each bus was replaced by this 8500 node test feeder with 550 inverters. That means this system had more than uh, 10,000 inverters and uh, also more than 160,000 nodes. So this platform, with this platform developed, we can study how different penetration level of grid forming and grid falling inverters impact the system uh, stability. So our initial study is to study the system uh, primary frequency response. So the first question is that, okay, if we still use grid following today, uh, sorry, if we still use the grid following inverters today, so how many grid following inverters can the synchronous machine dominated system uh, hold? So we can see that by then we study, uh, start to study a uh, different penetration level of grid following inverters. You can see that uh, for the base case is zero inverter is a black dashed line. The system primary frequency response is like this. But if we keep increasing the penetration of grid following inverters, we can see the frequency neither point is gradually reduced. And when, when, we, when the penetration level of grid following inverters goes up to about 80%, the system cannot be stable because we see some 35 hertz oscillation in this system. So for this platform, at least it shows that when the penetration goes off-grid following inverters goes above 80%, the system cannot be stable. 
And then we know grid forming inverters are important. For, so for the second question, OK, how many grid forming inverters are needed to maintain the stability of future uh, inverter dominated system? And starting from this 80% case, we start to replace some grid falling inverters with grid forming. And then we can see that once we have more and more grid forming inverters in the system, the system primary frequency, primary frequency response is significantly improved. And if we go to the 100% IBR case, that means we replace all the sequence machines uh, with grid forming inverters. And also in the system, we have about 12% grid forming inverters and 88% uh, of grid falling inverters. We can see that the frequency response is still quite stable because all the machine dynamics disappear and the, the frequency response is mainly governed by that droop control. So it's just from one steady state to another steady state. You can see that the frequency response for this case is even much better than traditional synchronous machine dominated system. So I think at least for grid forming inverters, it can do a better job than synchronous machines on the frequency control. So here actually is a stability boundary we identified through this study. Uh, you can see that um, the 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 we have use this platform, we have done actually a lot of simulations. Actually to, to run this simulation for each case, it takes about two hours to run each case because this is enormous, huge system. So actually, but our team did do a lot of simulation to get this uh, stability boundary. I think there are two points I think I'd like to uh, highlight that for case, for case A is that if we only have uh, grid following inverters, so that means when the grid following inverters penetration goes up to about 70%, uh, and the rest of them are, are synchronous machines, this is a stability uh, boundary point. So that means the 30% synchronous machines can hold the rest of 70% uh, grid falling inverters. But if we look at this point B, uh, this tells that, okay, for this 100% IBR system, we only need 12% of grid forming inverters to hold the rest of the 88% of grid falling inverters. Somehow that's what I mean is for grid forming inverters, you, you need less grid forming inverters in the system compared to synchronous machines to uh, maintain the frequency stability. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a very active work. So it, there's still a lot of work going on in this uh, research area. So in the first three sections, actually I talk, I talk a, lot about, a lot of good things about grid forming inverters. Grid forming inverters can survive the overload events and can improve a system primary frequency response. But if the grid forming inverters are that perfect, so that means we don't need to do research anymore. So, but, uh, actually, but actually in the reality, I think there are still a lot of challenges for grid forming inverters that, that need to be uh, further studied. So I think that, that's one of the critical things actually is about the fault right through behavior and the trends and stability of grid forming inverters. So after talking about this integrated TND system with 10,000 inverters, let's take a step back. Let's go back to uh, revisit this single machine infinite bus system. So for this single machine, synchronous machine infinite bus system, actually the old generation of engineers have developed very, developed very classical theories to understand the trend and stability behavior. You apply the fault, and after you clear the fault, if the system is stable or not. People, uh, the old generation of engineers de developed a very simple uh, equal error criteria to, to understand this behavior, right? Your swing equation is a key dynamics for this instability phenomenon. And people can use this very simple equal error criteria to predict the stability. However, let's, let's change this, replace that sequence machine with a grid forming inverter. And then let's study a short circuit fault and consider uh, uh, the dynamic behavior. So what we, what we find that during a short circuit fault, your grid forming inverter again is not an infinite bus. So during the fault, you have to limit your current to make sure the current does not exceed its maximum. However, we find that also there are different current limiting algorithms there. But what we find something very interesting is that uh, during the fault, uh, if the fault is cleared after a 0.1 second, the system is still stable. The phase angle can go back to its uh, previous value. However, if the fault lasts very long, and then for example, for this case, after 0.4 second, we find that after the fault, the system cannot maintain stability and the phase angle of this grid forming inverter uh, goes to another uh, steady state value. So actually the, the grid forming inverter's phase angle lose synchronism to the, to the grid. 
during this transient. So I think this is very similar to what you see in the synchronous machine, but you still, uh, still uh, there's still some difference there. And the key dynamics are basically uh, uh, governed by the droop control and the different current limiting algorithms. But I think that this tells us that there are some fundamental things we should look at for grid forming inverter dominated system, especially consider considering the fault rise through and the transient stability. So can we find some similar equal error for this grid forming inverters, for this single grid forming inverter infinite bus system and the predicted stability? Actually, I think this is a very, for me, this is the most critical thing for grid forming inverters to be studied recently. And uh, there are already quite a lot of uh, a lot of good work published in this area. And we are also working on this area. So some paper will be published soon and you will see that. Uh, so finally, I'd like to share some final thoughts. So I think there are still, still a lot of things that need to be studied for grid forming inverters, inverters. So from the control and operation perspective, how should grid forming inverters should respond to short circuit faults? Uh, and how different fault rise through behaviors of grid forming inverters impact the system transient stability and the protection. It's not just about current limiting, it's also about the system level stability and the protection. It's a very important topic we should study. And uh, I think we also need to understand how we want them to behave during the fault. It's also a critical thing. And also the second question is, how much overcurrent capability should grid forming inverters have for the future power grids? So nowadays, the most inverters just have 1.1 or 1.2 overcurrent capability during the fault. But does that really work for the future power grids with 100% grid forming inverter, 100% of inverters, not only grid forming inverters, but just 100% inverters, should the inverters still have very low fault current capability? I think we need to rethink about this question. And also in the future, there will be different types of grid forming inverters uh, developed by different manufacturers. So how we develop the interoperability guidelines to make sure those uh, different types of inverters can work uh, in a stable manner in the power systems. That's something we should consider. And also from the modeling and simulation perspective, because here we are not just studying one single grid forming inverter, we are studying a very complicated system that has potentially has millions of power electronic devices. So how we understand the dynamic behavior of this uh, platform, uh, the, this complicated system, how to simulate them? Should we develop a full size model? I think that sounds crazy because you need to simulate a system with maybe uh, hundreds of millions nodes, right? And the uh, inverters. Now, how, how should we develop aggregated model to accurately simulate the kind of this kind of behavior is also a critical thing. And also another important thing is that uh, today, uh, there are two types of simulation, right? Most people study the control strategy of inverters. They use the EMT, electromagnetic transient simulation to study a small system uh, for to study their control strategy of inverters. But if you really want to study a large scale system, this EMT simulation may not work very well for a large scale system. And for the large scale, scale system, people typically use a, a positive sequence phaser based simulation to study a large scale system. But how accurate can the phase assimilation uh, uh, capture the dynamics of the inverter-based resources? So what is, where is the boundary between the phase-based simulation and the EMT simulation? I think that's also a question we need to uh, explore. And uh, actually, uh, and another important question is from the industry application perspective, if you talk to utilities, uh, today, inverter manufacturers don't want to disclose, disclose any control of their inverters. They just send the utilities, uh, ISO operators, the black box model. Uh, although these black box, black box models can, co uh, can cover a lot of control details, it's accurate. But if from the power system perspective, if in the future, the penetration of inverters becomes very high, so does that mean the power system simulators need to simulate a system with very high penetration, potentially 100% black box model based power system? So it's very different from today's power system because today's power system model, they use synchronous machine models. All the models are transparent. It's easier, for, much easier to analyze the behavior, right? But if you use the black box models, very, very high penetration of black box model in your large power, power grid model, I guess it's very difficult to analyze uh, kind of uh, control protection or uh, control interaction dynamic behavior. So what level of details of IBR controls should be di disclosed? I think that's also a critical thing to be uh, considered from the industry application perspective. Okay, so uh, this is today's presentation. Uh, thank you again for the invitation and I'm open to any questions now. Thank you.
Great. Uh, thank you, Wave. Um, sure. I believe yeah. we have uh, a question in the chat from Sunil. If uh, Sunil, you want to come off mute and uh, ask your question. I didn't hear any question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you are muted. Tong, right? Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm, uh, Hi. I'm from uh, San Diego State University. Uh, excellent talk, and uh, I really learned a lot. So I have several questions. The first question is about uh, you said once a while you said if you kind of uh, replace a certain amount of uh, synchronous machine with IBRs so the system can survive, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, you mean the, the, the 10,000 inverter case for this case? Yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. okay, yeah. So I have a question. So you, you only mentioned the amount of the IBRs you, you will replace, but uh, will the location of the IBR matters? Uh, I think yes. I think um, because this is very complicated system, so I think a different location of IBRs definitely will impact the system. So mm. I, again, this, this boundary is ident purely identified through this simulation study. But if you have different cases, I guess the stability boundary can be slightly different. I think the location is definitely one thing uh, that can have an impact, especially if you regarding the, the voltage regulation perspective. Yeah, that, that is important. Yeah, location is important. Okay, thank you. Another question is about uh, this is uh, st stability boundary. So how do you get it? Do you get it uh, through simulation or through just- Yes. Uh, yeah, this is not an analytical study. This oh, is I basically see. the simulation study. I think I think it would be great if you can get some analytical studies to get a stability boundary. But I, I think that's, if you consider a system with 10,000 inverters, you want to do analytical study, I think that's probably yeah. very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my third, sorry, my long for my long yeah. question. My third question is about the the the, the single loop control, right? About yeah. one slide talk about uh, under frequency load shedding or. Ah uh, yes, this one under frequency load shedding. Uh, yeah. Yes. So for this slide, I have a question. So basically, here you basically you you address this overlap overload issue through lower, lowering the frequency and the trigger the under frequency uh, relay to tr uh, share the load. So yes. would it be possible that uh, to do the following way? So suppose we have overload, we're trying to dispatch, redispatch the, the, the generation produced by each IBR to balance the actual load. Would that possible? I, I think that depends on the different scenario. For this scenario, actually, no, no sources have available power to supply the additional load. So oh, in this micro, the total load is larger than the source. So oh, we I have see, to trip some load. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, my third, for last question about your simulator. So once yeah. I talk about uh, the simulator you use, so I'm wondering, is that the simulator uh, includes the dynamics of a line? Uh, no, this is, these are the, these are the phaser-based simulators. So uh -huh. all the network, they use power flow to solve the network solution. So we do not consider dynamics of the, of the line. Uh, that's so. why you probably, uh, you should not use this sim simulator to study the, the studies I performed here, like you know how different droop gain impact stability. That's, that will require the EMT studies. So yeah. I see, I see. Perfect. That's all, also my, all my questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, and, and Sunil had another question as well in in the chat around um, if the IBR penetration is instantaneous or capacity, uh, what models did you use um, detailing with switching dynamics or an average model? Uh, because this is a 10,000 inverter simulation, it's 1,600 nodes. One, well, sorry, 160,000 nodes. So we definitely don't, don't do the EMT study for this model. We are using an average model and also it's a phaser model. We ignore the line dynamics, those type of things. It's more like a traditional phaser based simulation. So, so I think the critical thing is to understand to what level or extent. So, can you can we still use a phaser based simulation to study the dynamics of inverter based systems? So, so actually, there is a lot of work going on in this area. And what we find that 
Grid forming inverters are more like synchronous machines. See so if, if you can use the uh, phaser two to study the dynamics of synchronous machine, that also indicates that you can use a phaser two to study the dynamics of the grid forming inverters. Um, Hey, wait, I have a quick question. Oh, hey. Hey, hey. Ying. nice to see you. Yeah, yeah nice to see you again. <laughs> um, so what my question is, uh, for the slides that you um, you described the TND code simulation, is this result um, got from that code simulation? Yes. Slide this, 26, this... 26, slide uh, 26. Yes, yes, the, the results are all from this code simulation, yes. Okay, so my question is for this, uh, you have grid lab D, so uh, in grid lab D, how you model this 550 IBRs on each feeder um, when you do the code simulation? And then what is the uh, communication interval between the uh, grid pack and the, the grid lab D? Okay, so the first question is in grid lab D, basically we, we de developed the grid forming and the grid following inverter models in grid lab D. Uh -huh. Because grid lab D itself is just three-phase phaser model, right? We just developed the uh, three-phase phaser model of grid forming and grid falling inverters. Yeah, uh, this is published in this paper. Uh, but this paper only shows the feeder with 10 inverters. But after that, actually, we tried that. Uh, we add 550 inverters on this 8,500 node test feeder. It still works pretty well, but runs slower. I think uh, it takes uh, 45 minutes to run uh, 45 seconds, basically one minute for one second simulation. And then that's for grid lab, the only simulation. And for the TND interface, uh, TND co-simulation, basically it's, uh, uh, we use Helix to, to interconnect them. So at each load bus, we send the substation, substation voltage to the grid lab feeder, and mm -hmm. the grid lab feeder returns its uh, substation current to the grid pack. So, and then it just, uh, they ex exchange information at uh, each simulation time step. Yeah, my main, question, main concern is uh, when you model the IBR uh, in uh, grid lab D, right? Um, yes. You communicate with uh, the uh, transmission level, um, the interval of that, how often you communicate uh, with that, because when you do the stability analysis, normally yeah. uh, that is second level, right? So uh, they exchange information every one million second for this co simulation. Okay. Yeah, one millisecond, one, right? One million second. One millisecond, okay. yes. So when you do that, then uh, inside the grid lab D, uh, they would uh, um, come. They, they actually control. Uh, they they have the um, they have the power flow running as well, right? Because you have yes. IPR and then you also have uh, your feeder um, power yes. flow, right? So yes. uh, when you consider and uh, when you say this is unstable. You're, you're, you're considering the um, the IBRs dropping offline or you consider it like, uh, what, what is your stability um, criteria? You say this will go unstable. You, you, you're measuring the frequency uh, yeah. or voltage or? So the uh, first question is in grid the simulation time step is also one million second. So that's uh, for the dynamic simulation. Uh -huh. And for the, the stability here is actually, as you can see that when the penetration level goes above 70%, we uh -huh. see this uh, 35 hertz oscillation. Uh -huh. That was what I mean by unstable. So this actually, so this 35 hertz oscillation actually actually come from the transmission level. After further investigation, I think that is because uh, your uh, inverter control at the transmission level, uh, when you was when when the system become system become very weak, it caused some 35 hertz oscillation caused probably caused by the caused by that great fall inverters. That uh, voltage control loop cannot maintain the stability when the system becomes when the sequence machine becomes less and less. So yeah, I think that's one thing. The the main problem I, I'm I'm fearing the problem of that is because your uh, grid forming device uh, exists uh, in both the transmission and distribution system. So yes. when you are doing this uh, um, artificial um, connection and then your uh, interval is only one millisecond then uh, you will cons you will create a discrepancy between the two control loops. One uh, yes. is a transmission level, the other is a distribution level. And that could create uh, a um, inconsistency which you wouldn't observe in real uh, in real life. So that uh, that's a very, very, yeah, that's a very good point. So there is a one time step delay between those yeah, two yeah, simulators. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we don't know if that's how that one time step delay will imp impact the simulation results and then potentially can cause numerical stability issues. We do observe that under some situations, if the simulation time step delay becomes much larger 
and that could potentially cause uh, numerical stability issues. But for this case, uh, we are studying the phaser level, the phaser level stability issues, mm -hmm. and the phaser level stability issue time step simulation time step is typically four million seconds. If you use PSSE, those type of simulation, your simulation time step is four million seconds. Your dynamics is much lower. You are not considering those. We do not model the very fast uh, switching level transients in this study. So I think for one million second time step, it's, it's okay to, to study this kind of behavior. But if you want to go faster to study those even faster time scale stabilities, that one time step delay might cause some issues. But for this phaser based simulation, I think uh, it's, it's good. And also, uh, we are doing a lot of co-simulation and also we want to validate the accuracy of co-simulation. So what we are doing is we are model this TND, not this big system, we are model a small system mm -hmm. in one, two and compare with the co-simulation to examine how that time delay can really impact the results. Mm -hmm. I think for now, that I think also depends on the time scale of dynamics you are interested in. For this time uh, scale, I think it doesn't have a, that large, uh, that kind of impact. Yeah, okay. but that's a very good question. I think some theory, some theoretical study need to be, need to be performed to study how that uh, one-time step delay impacts the numerical stability. Yeah, because um, my student, Victor, uh, he's now working for NAPA. He did a study for the time delay, and then it uh, we observed that kind of delay impact on the uh, on the simulation result. Um, yes. But uh, you're a one millisecond level. Ours is like a uh, 10, uh, 50 uh, microsecond um, okay. in the side, and on the other side is uh, probably 100 uh, um, millisecond, uh, 10, 10 millisecond or something like that. I couldn't recall, but uh, there could be a problem because of that. But a very good presentation. Thank you very much for uh, oh. answering my questions. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, looks like there's another question that someone asked in the chat. What is the impact of the capacitor for the single loop PF control stra strategy? What are the assumptions such that it can be neglected in, in the analysis? And if the capacitance is large, can it also be ignored? That, that's a very good point. So I think uh, in this presentation, I just make it very simple. So for the single loop through control, actually, in the fundamental frequency, actually, I I uh, eliminated the capacitor here. So in, in theory, it should be there because the, the capacitor should be there. But you know, the capacitor is basically, you design it, you design an LC filter for the cutoff frequency is like 600 Hertz. If you check the value of the capacitor, actually it's very, pretty small. It can, it can be ignored. Uh, basically, you, when you design the LC filter, you are not going to design a very large capacitor, right? So, so in the fundamental frequency, their value is typically very small. So it can be ignored, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, unless there are any other questions, um, looks like that's all the questions that have been asked in the chat. Hey, Limbi, I, I saw you. Yeah. I, hey, I, I, uh, wonderful yeah. talk. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. I have a question for you. So um, so uh, when you implement this tube control, I uh, usually have a filter that which is somehow equivalent to some uh, inertia, but it's quite small. So do you yes. think that we like really need inertia or should we like use some large inertia constant for that performing control? That, that's a good point. So I think when we design the droop control, the purpose of that low pass filter is to filter out those harmonics, right? When you measure the power P and yeah. Q, you don't want those uh, or you know, that harmonics, those, those type of thing impact your control behavior. So that's the purpose of the low pass filter. We only add the 10 million seconds. That, I think that works pretty well for harmonics loads and also for the unbalanced loads, right? You, you filter all those 120 yeah. hertz oscillation. And uh, during normal operation, I do not see the need to add inertia. I think add inertia, add inertia is just like you are, you are potentially just going back to go back to the single machine dominance system, right? Because when you have this mm -hmm. swing equation, these three equations cause oscillations. And for machine, this is something that you cannot avoid. But for grid forming inverters, if you bring them back, and I think it just, uh, you just create some problems for yourself. So I think we, we don't need to have that in, in normal operation. But during the trend and stability and the fault, uh, then things become different because 
during the fault, you want to see how your face angle is moving during the fault. You, you did some wonderful yeah. work in this trend and stability, right? How this face, how the change of face angle and your droop control and the inertia might have impact the, how the face angle is changing during the fault. So that's something mm -hmm. we, we, st we are still looking at, I think not fully addressed yet. So it's, people are still studying that, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Thank because you. I see uh, in your slides like 28 or something, when you have a lot of um, uh, uh, dropping uh, converters, uh, yes. then basically the frequency uh, just the, maybe is quite like just like from one steady state to another <laughs> steady state so so we yeah, really don't very, yeah. Here, right? yeah yeah the frequency division is already very small so yeah i was very curious whether really like we do we really need inertia because people now they're talking about uh low inertia system a lot but yeah perhaps instead of adding inertia adding some troop it that would be enough yeah. for that yeah i i i I personally, I don't think we need the uh, inertia for okay. uh, great world basis. Either. But look, these days people have different understanding of inertia. And uh, yeah, if you talk to people in industry, their understanding of inertia is very different from our understanding of inertia. So yeah, okay. it's, it's still very confusing, I, I think, at this stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and maybe another question is uh, when you have a lot of inverters, uh, because when you replace maybe one synchronous generator with uh, maybe 200 inverters and all of these inverters are operated uh, as in, in this reforming mode, would they be equivalent to like one huge synchronous generator or one huge uh, reforming converter there? Or is there something different? I think that depends on the, the scenario you are looking at, right? If you have one big power plant and you, have, you want to have 300 megawatt grid firm inverter. In reality, mm -hmm. you know that they are actually this two, two, megawatt, two megawatt inverter, you have 150 of them, they work in parallel, and then they become mm -hmm. the 100, uh, sorry, uh, become the 300 megawatt power plant. So in that case, I think if you can, can, can only consider the POC, you can equivalent the, those 300 inverters as one inverter, big inverter for the bulk power system study, right? But that's it's only for the bulk power system study. However, if I'm going to study this distribution feeder with 500 inverters distributed among this feeder, if you want to look at mm -hmm. the details of the voltage profile of the entire feeder, uh, you, you probably cannot do that kind of aggregation, right? So I think it's also yeah. that so it's also related to how you what scenario you are looking at. So what level of details you, you want to see? Yeah. Yeah, that means yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for the questions and discussion. Uh, it looks like we are at time for uh, today's seminar. Um, thank you again, Wei, for your presentation and hope to see folks at uh, the next seminar.